NPR, Daniel Fogel, who is a, at this point, postdoc at this point, assistant professor, visiting in terminus. <laughs> He's something or other at the Center for Bioethics. This is Matthew Lau, who is the, uh, who is a professor and director of the Center for Bioethics. And this is Jordan McKenzie, who is, who is a faculty member now at the Center for Bioethics, but as of next year, will be a professor of philosophy at Virginia Tech. Have I got it? Okay. We, we really threw a curve to the AB people. <laughs> hello, hello, okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Matthew Liao. So uh, I want to first of all just thank you all for being here. I've learned so much um, as a bioethicist. This is so uh, invaluable. Uh, to me, just sort of having this the lived experience. Um, and I also want to say uh, a couple things. So one is that, so I, I, um, I wrote this book called The Right to Be Loved, and it's about children's right to be loved, and I actually talk about IVF, and uh, so my argument extends to um, sort of uh, whether you're donor conceived, or I, basically the argument is that everyone has a right to be loved. And I um, one of the points of the argument is that actually everyone has a duty to make sure that every child is loved. And so uh, they're sort of, I distinguish between what I call primary duty bearers, which might be the parents, but then I also talk about associate duty bearers, people who uh, need to support primary duty bearers to make sure that they can discharge their duties or to step in if the primary duty bearers are no longer there or if they're abusive and so on and so forth. So. Um, so that's sort of one thing that I've talked, up, uh, talked about in my work. Uh, I defended in my work, so um, I sort of, um, I defended a rights-based account of uh, uh, parental rights. I sort of said that um, actually uh, parents have a right to uh, uh, have their own, uh, they, they have the right in the first instance to, uh, their bio uh, to sort of parent their biological uh, children. And, uh, but then they might waive that or if they're dead or deceased, you know, then somebody else might need to step in and so on and so forth. And so that view, I think, is very amenable to sort of the discussions that we're having here because I think that um, uh, one of the things it says is that um, like whether you're uh, 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 donor conceived or you're naturally born, the parents have certain obligations. They have, with the rights come the responsibility. And so, um, and uh, I also think that they have a right to know. Uh, I, I think that uh, the donor conceived children have a right to know about their genetic identity because one of the arguments for why uh, uh, parents have the right to parent their bio uh, biological children is the genetic tie. It's sort of the genetic, the importance of the genetic history. Um, and so, uh, so I'm very sympathetic to sort of what's being said here. And I just want to uh, sort of in re response to uh, um, Ima, uh, just that I think that um, we can't just look at uh, whether someone is having a good life or not a good life, sort of if they, they seem to be faring very well in order to assess whether it's a, what I call the fundamental condition. Because you, know, you can imagine that, so just here, here's a toy example. It's, it, you know, having deep personal relationship is a fundamental condition on my view. It means that everybody should have it, right? Everybody should be able to have, uh, you know, relation, deep personal relationship with parents, friends, as, and so on and so forth. But you can imagine that uh, some people might choose not to have it or some people don't have friends or, and they can still physically do very well. But psychologically, they might not, um, you know, it's very hard to assess their psychological well-being. Right, and so just uh, just because they're these donor conceived children and they seem to be doing well doesn't mean that they are in fact doing well. And so I think that you can't just look at 
uh, just sort of do that. Uh, the well-being assessment is very complicated and very tricky, and we shouldn't look at that and immediately say, oh, therefore it's not a need, and there, uh, therefore it's not a right. So, yeah. so actually, I, I want to follow up on Matthew's last comment, because this is something that uh, I have had an interest in too, and that is, um, the disconnect between the kinds of things that can be measured in research, and this kind of relates to, it's an epistemological problem I'm talking about. The disconnect between the kinds of things that can be measured in research in a scientifically um, valid way and the issues that arise in the lives of donor-conceived people. Um, and to what extent we think that, well, first of all, it would be nice to know how you think the research ought to be done. That is, what should the researchers be looking for? Um, they are going to be looking for things like how donor-conceived children do in school, how they, uh, how they do in the workplace, how, uh, how they score on standard psychological instruments, and so on. Um, and the question is, is that capturing what you think needs to be captured, and how would you do the research? Uh, because I fear that just saying we need more research uh, is not necessarily going to get to the heart of the issue. If anyone wants to answer that, yes? Um, so I don't think we will ever get research until we get accurate information and regulations. You need regulations. If people aren't reporting how many sperm donor conceived children there are and they're not going back and reporting that, or there's nothing noted that they were medically assisted in the conception of their child, you're never gonna get accurate anything. We need, we need regulations, we need legislation, we need rules for people to follow, we need to impose ethics. You're never gonna get that information until it is required for the industry to report it. So uh, actually, if I may just continue, I have a question. Um, do the, um, do sperm banks require their, I guess the term is commissioning parent? No. no? Hmm? Recipient. Recipient parent, recipients. They don't require them to report whether they have born a child. So the, yeah, and so they don't know. I see, okay. Um, so we'll now. So in regards to what to research, um, I am hoping to be able to do that someday, but um, I was an ideal child and I knew my whole life that I was donor conceived because um, I was a single mother by choice. And if someone had studied me, I did great in school. I love my mom so much, everything was perfect, but no one ever asked me, including my mom, do you um, lay in your bed at night and fantasize about how you're gonna find your dad someday? Do you think about how you have siblings in California, hundreds of miles away, that you'll never get to know? No one asked me if that was important to me, to the effect that I didn't even know it was important to me. And, um, and I think those are the kinds of questions. It's leading, it's hard, <laughs> you're leading kids. Um, but we, you're not allowed to think those things as a child, often by the way our parents treat us. And um, I think once we allow children to acknowledge those feelings, then we can actually study the psychological effects. Um, I would, this is just off the top of my head, but I would guess there's a lot of correlations with um, children who have been adopted um, around questions of identity. And so there's probably some good research there that could be drawn from if it hasn't already. Um, I feel like that's a core, at least in my personal experience, like although it was only a year ago I learned I was donor conceived and I'm 44 years old. Um, <laughs> thank you, Albert, for your phone call. Um, <laughs> 
Um, but uh, I think I had this sense of not really belonging. I don't know my whole life. I don't know how pervasive that is among the donor conceived, but that would be an, in oh, look at that, wow. Um, so I think there's questions around identity and sort of the senses that one has of throughout their lifetime that then become explained later in life and how that ha has impacted their relationships and their sense of well-being and all that kind of thing. Go ahead. I was going to. Oh, okay. Uh, so if, if, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to continue. This. Um, that so one of the things I wonder about is, you know, lots of children suspect that they were adopted. Um, who weren't adopted. <laughs> There's a point in life when children just think, oh my God, these can't be my real parents. <laughs> I, I, actually, I had a fantasy that my real parents were in the broom closet. <laughs> uh, these people, no, that, 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 that these people, that the, okay, point taken, yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, to some extent, Again, and now I'm playing devil's advocate because if if you know anything about what I've written, uh, this is oh okay, this is this is not my side of the issue. But still, um, I wonder to what extent donor conceived people are attributing to their being donor conceived feelings that maybe all children have or many children have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Yes, could be. Um, oh, I, I t to me, as someone who, who felt that very, very strongly throughout my life, and I'm, a, I'm a, as I say a lot, I'm a lot like my mom. I definitely, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm a lot like my mom. I definitely have similarities, a lot of similarities to my dad who raised me. Um, but when I met my biological father, I was like, oh, my God. You know, it was, it was me. Um, and what I, th what I think, so I never felt like I was out of place with my parents, but more out of place in, in the world in a sense of, of belonging um, in a very deep place. But what I, what I kind of get at is that I think that feeling can be common among a lot of groups of people. So whether you're adopted, whether you're donor conceived, whether you, you know, know early that you're, you're gay or lesbian and you feel that, whether you're tra transgender, you know, various identity, parts of our identity that leave us feeling different from a majority. However, unlike a lot of those things, being donor conce conceived is something that can be dealt with. You know, it's something that other people have the control over and we're the, you know, victims in a sense of that, whereas other parts of our, our identity are, are, are just you know, inborn things. If you're, you know, if you know you're lesbian, you feel out of place, then that's something that's a part of you. But this is something where your parents can, can something can be done about this. Um, I just wanted to also kind of, uh, Courtney, right? Yeah. So um, I also have known from a very young age because I have. A lesbian mom so there was no other explanation I've known my whole life and you know I was a gifted student I you know honor student all of that and there's so much data and focus being put towards analyzing how children in LGBT families are being well adjusted there you know the the kids are all right I have seen that study come out 17 times now of them trying to prove that we are all right in and any feelings of, you know, I felt some of those same things of, I definitely had those fantasies from a very young age of like, oh, I wonder who he is. I want, you know, every time I threw a penny in the fountain, I was wishing to find my dad. You know, I love my family. That's not an issue, but I feel like that, all of those things if I expressed them, or if someone researched me, that would be misappropriated to the fact that I was raised by a lesbian. And it's not anything to do with, I mean, I don't feel, and I 
specifically work with queer spawn like of all ages like this is something I've thought a lot about for my whole life like I really do not feel like that is based in my queer spawn identity I think that has a lot to do with not knowing having a fully anonymous donor and the lack of ethical like the that missing piece there the the fact that I was unable and had no agency that my agency was taken away at conception. That is something that I express to other people that I can quantify for other people who have lesbian parents when they're trying to say, well, that's because you don't have a dad. That, that's what a researcher would see. They would blame that on my, me having lesbian parents. That's not what it's about. So you're gonna have a lot of issues of trying to do that research with these intersectionalities that we all have of, you know, single parent, you know, single mothers by choice. If you study someone who was born with a single mother by choice, you're gonna you're gonna have some researcher bias against, you know, single mothers. You know, it's gonna come out, well, he should have just had a father. And it's not about that. I have lots and lots of parents. I have more than more than two parents. I have like six parents. I'm not lacking for parents. <laughs> I, but I believe that every person, that to me, those are just other points of connection that I could be making. I don't necessarily value him over finding my sperm donor versus finding I wanted to reach back out to a non-biological lesbian parent that I had when I was young who had left me. That was equally important to me. It is, I see it as an opportunity for additional points of connection in the universe and not that it's somehow going to uh, complete my two-parent dichotomy, like, because um, I have a 12-parent dichotomy. Uh, <laughs> so. Oh, okay. you did good. Yeah. Um, so my name's Lynn Spencer, and getting back to the question of how to do research, um, I actually did some research in 2000, and so I have one suggestion. <laughs> um, so my research was, it was for a master's of humanistic and clinical psychology, and we, at the school I went to, we did qualitative research rather than quantitative. And so for those of you who don't know, qualitative research, you take a small sample of people. Um, you know, we had a few questions at the beginning, but then you open it up open-ended um, so that whatever is important to the question you're studying, they can bring it out. And again, there may be bias, like the people that I studied were the people that were politically active and so had a lot of strong feelings. But um, just, I mean, in general, that could be one way to get more at what's really important to the people involved. So I'm a twin, and I, like, via egg donation, and my twin is, like, he responded, like, the exact opposite way. So he responded, like, he just started laughing in the car and, like, didn't care. Even and so... When you were told. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was told about a year ago. I'm 25. And um, so that's the major argument that my parents use, that, oh, well, your brother doesn't feel this way, he doesn't act this way. So I think if there were some studies done, like kind of maybe, I know it's hard for to find people who don't speak up about it, who aren't part of it, but I think that we could gather a lot from that type of thing where, you know, like meeting other people like my brother, <laughs> I would say, somehow finding that. And I think a lot of uh, families experience the same thing as well, like, I guess. Oh, cool, my turn. 
Hi. Um, so thank you. I actually really wanted to bring up a point about that, but I didn't quite know how to bring it up in the discussion. So I'm from a lot of half siblings. <laughs> so I think we're up to like 56 at the moment. And we had one, we're from multiple sperm banks. And one sperm bank we found a couple months ago confirmed, was it 60 or 106 confirmed births? It was 60, so we're about at like over 100 confirmed. May I just ask how many of you are here? Um. <laughs> Yeah, we're um, also pretty fortunate because our um, sperm donor is Facebook friends with us, so we're like, oh, hey, what's up? And he's like, yo, and it's, <laughs> so that's, we've been pretty fortunate in that regard. But because we have such a large sample of us, um, we've seen a lot of similar trends as well, and like the number, 50, 54 or 56% are not, have not found out the donor or something like that, or. But we kind of have noticed a similar trend, like around half of us have like a bunch of siblings who aren't interested as well. So of like the over 50 of us, only about 25 or so are pretty active and interested. And I just think that it would be really important with like polls and stuff to understand both sides. Because most of the time, the people who participate are the ones who are interested and are super passionate and personal with their experience. But I mean, I have a younger brother who's like, don't talk about it, please. Like, it doesn't matter. And I think a lot of the rest of us can relate. So I just think that that narrative is also super important to understand, to gather the full picture of everyone's experience. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. Hi, um, I'm a student in the bioethics department here. So thank you to everyone who is here today. This is really fascinating. I have two questions. So. The first, I know there will be a variety of responses to this, I'm sure, but I was wondering, just on a sort of practical level, if you had a friend or somebody in your life who was looking to conceive with don using donor gametes, what would your advice or guidance be to them? How would you, <laughs> what, would, what would you say or not say or advise them to do or not do? Um, and then my second question, I'm just very curious. So my second question was, um, if any of you have, so if you've grown up um, as donor-conceived children with, with siblings in your families, um, if they have um, been biological children or conceived with other donors, if they've felt um, hurt by new connections that you've established with um, by your people you found out that are related to you through uh, genetic testing. It looks like we have an answer to your first question. <laughs> uh, thank you for asking that. And also, um, thank you, Daniel, for being here and, and asking preemptively <laughs> what it's like to, to go through the process. I had, sorry, um, I am donor conceived and I have a very close friend who um, has known my whole story. Uh, I think on our very first time we met, we poured our hearts out to each other and, and bonded over various um, other parental issues that we, we each had. And about two years into our friendship, she sat across the table from me and said, I think I'd like to have a, a, a baby on my own. We were both 40 at the time, and she you know, thought it was the clock was ticking. And she wanted my blessing, maybe? Um, and the best thing that I could tell her was, don't choose an anonymous donor. <laughs> um, which I think we can all agree on in this room, uh, she hadn't even considered it. There are so many options out there, um, but the and, and I said you need to tell your child early, make it you know destigmatize it as much as possible because I think the hardest part has been finding out later in life. Um, there's no you can't change how you parent and what your child is going to experience. But um, keeping a secret is always going to be starting off on a bad foot. Come back to Hello. Um, this has been a wonderful symposium. Um, to answer your question, I think uh, the truth will set you free. It's a little cliche. But I think that honesty is always the best policy. 
Uh, just like with adopted children, I had a friend who adopted a child and didn't tell her until she was 10 years old. So it was um, very shocking to her at that time. So I think getting used to it from a young age is very important. Now, your second question was about how your siblings feel. I found out a year ago I was 60 years old. I found out through a DNA test I had no idea that I was donor conceived. At the time, I wasn't, my brother wasn't speaking to me, hadn't spoken to me for three years, and I had to call him. And um, I told him to do the DNA test, and he did, and he is my father's biological child, my social father. So um, he's 15 months younger than me, so somehow my parents who had uh, who I knew had fertility issues, had my brother on their own. Or maybe the doctor mixed the sperm. We don't know, you know, because this was a long time ago. But the discovery actually repaired our relationship. I think he was very jealous that I now had two sisters and another brother. So maybe it was a good thing. Um, but that said, I was thinking about something that was said earlier. I think if my parents knew, which I don't know whether they did or not because they are no longer alive, if they knew and they didn't tell me, and I wonder what if they did, would I have felt not a part of my family? Would I have, my brother, I would have felt he's, they knew he was their biological child because she got pregnant without any, um, you know, without any assistance, would I have felt like I wasn't a part of the family? How would have that impacted me as a child, as a teenager, when you go through that angsty period in your life, and knowing my father wasn't my father, knowing my brother was only half a brother? So for me, at this age, it's been an amazing blessing. This is my half-sister who told me how I was conceived. Uh, on the day I found out that I was donor conceived, same day. Um, and we found our biological father uh, a month later and he's still alive. And all very accepting. So for me, it's been a blessing. I know for some other people, it's been, there's a lot of emotion, negative emotion attached to it. But I think for me, there would have been more negative emotion had I known as a child and felt like I wasn't a part of the whole family and my brother was. I'm just going to add something to this. Uh, actually, this is not that uncommon in families where the parents adopt a first child. It is not uncommon for them to have a successful pregnancy. And usually, often in those families, the first child knows it's adopted. Um, I mean, unlike your experience. The one family I know in which that happened it was indeed a cause of uh, a lot of difficulties between the siblings and so on. So I, I can see your, your point. David, you have two questions. Um, yeah, to answer your question, I was recently in the position of um, needing to give this advice um, to family members who are considering donation, and um, and I, you know, I said that as you're looking at qualities um, you know of your donor I think a really important overlooked quality is the willingness of that donor to engage um, you know and so when your child eventually finds this person you know you don't want to set them up for pain or the pain of rejection and so I think that's a really important thing to look at and you know there's sort of a spectrum of anonymous to non anonymous but but that um, the willingness to be a known donor gives you a clue as to how that person may respond when they're approached. Um, they also asked, um, they, they said that they were considering um, donors of a different racial background than themselves, and they also asked about that. And, you know, and I also said that um, I didn't have experience with that, but that I felt like they had a real obligation, um, as parents would in a transracial adoption, to be willing um, to, to really address that intersectionality and, you know, and additional potential complexities and that it would be really important, um, you know, that they, that, they, um, that they were up for that. 
I just wanted to address your question about siblings. So um, I learned that the brother that I thought was my full brother growing up, um, he's older, he was born in 76. I found out that he has known since 1992 that he was donor conceived and he knew that we had separate donors. Again, I learned at age 38, I'm 40 now. When I had, um, he lives in Japan, he has no interest in DNA or any of that. Um, I guess because he lives in Japan and you know we both married interracially, so my mom was like, oh, thank God for that. Um, my brother, I don't talk to him about it anymore. I tried to share originally, and I did confront him when he came for a visit after I had found out and asked him why he didn't tell me. He assumed I knew. So I was the secret everybody else knew. Um, I did find another brother, a paternal brother, who is six months younger than me. And because we matched, he found out he was donor conceived and he didn't know either. Um, he happens to be gay, so there was no chance. But we lived right around the corner from each other. Um, I've only found that, I haven't found anything else. But it has not jeopardized my relationship. My mother is actually probably watching us right now from Connecticut. Um, <laughs> so she would have been here had she not had to work. Um, so we do have openness and I don't love her any less but I do have some trust issues now. Um, and I just wanted to address that question. Thank you. Um, in regards to the type of research you had yes. said earlier, I'd like to follow up on what Lynn said on the importance of qualitative research. I think, as you can hear, we have a lot of stories. And there, is, there isn't that other side of it, of the ones of us who don't want to speak. And so we really need research that gets to both sides, as was said, but also is done as a meta-analysis. And perhaps it's done as a phenomenological qualitative studies of IPA type research that is some, I, it's, it's phenomenological interviewing qualitative methods. And these are ways that would get to some of the problems. I think we've all filled out tons of surveys and we all feel eh, maybe like a little bit represented by them. Um, so that's, that's one area, but on the phenomenological point of, of what we need to research, the genetic testing boon in and of itself, a lot of the research that was cited this morning is pre the boom, right? So there's going to be masses of more data coming out. So we need to do meta-analysis on things, we need to find the accurate numbers, and then we can come up with, you know, where we feel on policies and where we feel on ethical positions because we don't even know the lay of the land right now. Okay. I have a question for the panel. Why the double standard? Why do we need to provide empirical evidence and surveys without selection bias to put a stop to a practice when none of that was needed to put a start to the practice in the first place? I was actually just thinking of that as well. And I was wondering whether a survey to, not just to people who are donor conceived or, but just to everybody would be more useful. Like sort of just imagine, you know, so I'm a philosopher, so we like hypothetical situations. So imagine you just do a survey of the following form. You say, look, imagine that you're 35 years old and then you found out that you are donor conceived, right? Would you want to know X, Y, and Z? Would you want to know the identity of your, you know, the, the options, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd be, I mean, this is, I'm sitting in an armchair, right, sort of this is, but I, I would guess that most people would say they would want to know. And then, you know, there are various things that they want to know. And, but, uh, so, so uh, and then there's another thing which uh, I'm sort of, uh, from hearing uh, from, you know, sort of your stories, I, it seems like they're, they're sort of, uh, it might be useful to distinguish between sort of uh, the de-anonymization, de sort of finding out that you're donor conceived, 
And then th that's sort of one part of the equation. But then there's another part, which is sort of meeting the people, sort of like completing, sort of getting to know that person who, you know, like who don't, like who, you know, who was the donor. Um, and so, because there are some people here who are, uh, who knew that they were donor conceived, but they still felt that there was this gaping hole in their life, right? And they felt the need for closure or at least the need to really get to know the other person. And I feel like that's a, also an important element. So it's not complete, uh, the, 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 the problem isn't addressed just by the, the anonymization. There's also, we also need to figure out a mechanism for people to be able to meet with their donors, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, yeah. That doesn't really answer my question. Yes. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if you knew. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, can I just say yeah, go ahead. Um, so we kind of, all of us have anecdotal answer to what non-donor conceived people would say because we talk to non-donor conceived people in our lives all the time. We have, um, and it comes up in our group, we have partners who don't understand, we have friends who don't understand, who say really heartless things. My Airbnb host last night told me, well, you have to understand that no one knew that you would ever be able to find your dad. And she's been literally thinking about this for like 30 seconds of her life. Um, and so, um, you know, they, people don't understand that knowing your biology is a privilege and you don't see your privilege when you have your privilege. You don't know that it's important to you to know your biological parents because you know your biological parents. You know, I had a friend say, well, I don't know why you want to know your siblings. I have two and we never talk. Well, but, but you know who they are and you know you don't like them. So, you know, I, I should get that chance. And so um, you can study everybody, but they're, they're, they don't understand. And I don't know how we make them understand. It's the knowledge. So I'm, I'm just going to add uh, one of the things I've said on the subject um, in writing is uh, w when I wrote my papers on this subject, people would say to me, well, I I'm not anything like my, my, my parents. And, and, and what I said was, well, you know them. And what you're saying is the ways in which you are like them, you reject. <laughs> It's not that you're not like them. Of course you're like them. Um, so it's a similar, it's a similar thing. I, I want to go back to your question, though, because you raised the question of the whole practice. So are you saying that you are questioning whether donor conception should be practiced at all? So. Okay, I, 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 so um, I, I actually didn't expect that given what we've heard today because so much, even, even Aaron's talk was about how to make the practice more ethical and not questioning the, whether the practice itself is ethical. Um, so now I, I think we should probably uh, Call, call it a day. We have another day. Um, we will come back tomorrow. But um, this is a question that, that, that interests me. Um, and so uh, I'd be interested in hearing from people on that topic. All right, one more comment. Yeah, everybody will be back tomorrow, so we'll, yeah, we'll do that. And uh, as today, breakfast will start at 9.15, and we'll all be here. Thank you so much for being here, um, and have a good evening.